last time when we were talking, we we looked at the limits of rationality and how that's connected to various historical and philosophical movements. And rationality has this sense, uh, an exaggerated sense in our civilization at the moment. And so we're looking at that and how that ties to the way we look at technology and how we build technology. And so we also wanted to explore what are the positive aspects of technology. So technology seems to have this paradoxical position of both the poison and the cure for the troubled time that we find ourselves in. And in that context, you had used this word pharmacon, uh, which originally was coined by Plato and has a connection with the pharmacy. So maybe you can take us into that and we can explore if there is a way to uh, resolve this paradoxical quality of technology. Sure. Thank you, Kenan. Yeah, indeed. We touched on some of this last time and we can elaborate on some of these themes. We were discussing last time about how technology is a pharmacology, you know, and uh, some contemporary philosophers like Jacques Derrida or Bernard Stiegler have talked about it in those terms. When we use the term pharmacology for technology, they're referring to the fact that technology, as we understand it, is an attempt to piece together the world as specialized objects. So there is the separation of the subject and the object. There is the sense that the reason of the human being is a kind of a faculty, the faculty of God, with which a kind of a rational world has been created, a, a world with reason, a world with logic inside it, you know? So that if we use our mind, we can piece together this understanding and make an even better world than what have, what what we've been given. And that's part of the drive of modernity. And that's what's brought us to our times where, as we were discussing last time, it's a moment from a certain viewpoint of triumph. We understand the laws of many things and we actually have a sense of almost of omnipresence across the world, omniscience and omnipotence of a certain kind, of a technological kind. But we are also at the same time facing a tremendous crisis in our world. So it's this kind of talk about the cure and the poison. We are experiencing it firsthand. We are experiencing the fact that all our tinkering with with the earth has caused severe ruptures in the climate. The geological system is reacting and is throwing us almost to the edge of extinction. Our understanding of economics, our understanding of politics, our understanding of the word market and creating a certain kind of a human, a rational human that will span the world and derive benefit from it is backfiring because there are many ethnicities, many cultures that don't buy into this narrative, religions that feel that they've been suppressed and that, that are reacting in aggressive ways. There is the entire underbelly of human existence, which is all about life and its urges, a certain kind of fantasy life, which doesn't uh, really buy into its subordination by the mind, and which is erupting in all kinds of neurosis and psychosis around us. So we see the poison, which is spewing all over in our times, more than ever before, across the world. And at the same time, we see this hour of the unification of the world, the sense that we actually have uh, all the opportunities of our time universalized across the globe. So this is in a way the pharmacology that we are seeing technology has led us to. It's the effect of the pharmacology that technology is. I'd say the narrative of triumph is, is in a sense a dangerous narrative because it hides the fact, it creates a certain kind of an illusory bubble that hides the fact that we are in a very grave crisis right now. 
we live in a dystopian time. We are trying to patch back all the cracks that are appearing one after the other. We had a two-year pandemic. We are still trying to patch it up. We haven't really succeeded. We will enter into a phase of chronic pandemic. It's going to be something which we live with from now. And at the same time, we have entered into something which is almost like a third world war. A, a, a situation where the power lines, the power politics of the world have ruptured in a sense and are in a state of conflict. So these kind of things, and then at the very political level inside each nation, you we see this kind of conflict between the the polarization of politics. See, authoritarian and you know, kind of dictatorial rulers on the one hand and a drive towards liberal politics on the other. This is happening across the world. It's a situation that's almost going out of hand. Uh, we don't have really good solutions to. So this is, in a sense, an understanding of the pharmacology of technology that has led us to this point. Now, you are asking about what's the good and what's the bad. What we call the good of technology, which is the kind of better, more convenient life that it has brought us, um, comes with the, with the price tag. It's the price tag of all these things that I've said. It's also the price tag of a kind of dulling of life, a sense of comfort. You know, I mean, if you think about the 1960s, when the United States staged a counterculture and counterculture that was strong enough to really bring about political changes, stop a war, create a different sense of life, a sense of possibilities and of utopian futures. We don't see that in the same way today. And one of the reasons is that the underlying sense of comfort that we've developed due to the conveniences and this triumphalist narrative of technology prevents us from really taking seriously the kind of serious danger that we are faced with right now. See, We also see the amount of polarization that has taken place across the world in the, in the United States and across the world. This polarization also figures. It's part of the effect of this uh, pharmacology and it figures in our inability to band together to bring about changes that actually are beneficial for humankind. Though many understand it. See, we can't take that step because in a sense, we don't have the will. Our will has been crushed, has been dulled, and has lost its vigor. See, So all of this goes to tell you that even what we call the benefits of technology are, to a large extent, living with the price tag, which we hide from ourselves and which is hidden from us. And we also hide it from ourselves. Now, where is the other side of technology? Why is it a pharmacon? What is the good of technology? Well, there is the good of technology. The good of technology is the fact that if we didn't let technology shape us into the kind of subject that capital wants to make of us, you see, this is all that I'm talking about is coming largely due to the reaction of our inability to really understand the world in a piecemeal fashion. We cannot do that using the mind. The technological premise is faulty in that sense. But it's also arising because we have created a certain kind of a system that is turning against us. See? 
it's turning against us because it's 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 a very powerful system. This relates to what you were calling singularity, etc. It's a certain faculty of the human, the rational faculty, that's been fine-tuned to its maximum and exteriorized and universalized. So this universal machine of the mind, rationality and memory and computational ability exteriorized is being utilized by a master signifier. What is the master? There's always the attempt of a social master signifier catching hold of the springs of technology. You see, and I'll come in a moment to how technology is not just a material machine. Technology is a, a subjective way of being before it becomes a material machine, you know. So, but whatever it is, this subjective way of being, this method and its material manifestation are always, you know, under the will to power. There's some will to power that wants to hold it. And this will to power wants to be a master signifier, something which is going to be the will to power over everything. Okay. So it could either be some kind of a warlord or despot of some sort, or it could be capital. So this, these are the two major master signifiers of our time, and they are converging. So this ubiquitous control of human beings by the technologies of capital, you know, how do we make people want think? We, we fine-tune the technology of making people want so that they buy, you know, they buy into and they buy and they produce what it is that is necessary to buy. And the, the value of this, you know, not the use value, but the value, the added value, the profit value of this is what is whisked by that person or those persons who hold the levers of this machine, you see? So this is where the master signifier is controlling our subjectivity and making us into subjects of a certain kind, right? On the other hand, so that is the, the poison. But on the other hand, if we become conscious of that, then we have the possibility of turning the lever around, of deciding for ourselves to what extent we will engage what do we want or what are, what are our wants, you know, and what do I need to do to derive what I want, you see? So that changes. And their technology can be a, a, a you know, a positive force. You know, I mean, you and I, today it's possible for somebody even without going to school to actually use the resources of the internet to get themselves a perfect education. It's possible for somebody without very much money or, you know, even using free and public resources to have access to that kind of uh, possibility of education. See, but they need to want to do it. Long before they want to do it, they are told what they will become what they can become. So the images with which we develop our subjectivity, you know, what we are made into subjects, uh, often determined before we decide what we want to become, uh, what our future is going to be. See? So here we come to the notion of what it is that we can become so that we regain our sense of being who we are, as well as we put technology to the use that it's supposed to be put. And that is, again, a kind of a retrieval of the notion of the will to power. The will to power is not a will to power over others. It's not a will to power in, in, in getting more and more. 
it's a will to self exceeding you see it's a will to become the fullness of who we are a will to being and a will to becoming not a will to having and a will to subjugating or oppressing you see so if we make that reversal then technology becomes something new technology even as it exists becomes something with which we fulfill that drive inside us <laughs>